That's certainly a far different sound than the music I heard as a Kiowa youth. But those rock and roll musicians and the Quakutal dancers filmed some 50 years ago have something in common with me, our Native American heritage, our Indianness. And that's why it's important to me to give you some information concerning that heritage. Three tiny ships, exactly like these, helped change life in America by bringing 104 colonists to Jamestown, Virginia in 1607. Those settlers formed the first successful English colony in the New World. But in reality, it was not a new world, nor was it unsettled. We are told that Columbus discovered America in 1492. The truth is, Indians discovered America thousands of years before Columbus. Before the colonists built Jamestown, cultural developments were taking place on both sides of the Atlantic. Even as great cities were springing up in Europe, Native Americans were also building cities and making scientific discoveries on this side of the ocean. Both before and after European colonization, Indians have had a major impact on the total development of the United States. That impact is more than painted horsemen attacking a stagecoach, more than bows and arrows. The most profound impact of the American Indian on the development of our nation is reflected in our very form of government. The distinctive political ideals of American life emerged from a rich Indian democratic tradition. That tradition can be traced to documents here in the National Archives. Universal suffrage for women, the pattern of states within a state, the tradition of treating chiefs as servants of the people instead of their masters, the demand that the community respect the diversity of men and their dreams. All of these things were part of the American way of life long before the arrival of Columbus. The first regional democratic governing body in what is now the United States was not the Continental Congress, which met at Independence Hall in Philadelphia. Even the Virginia Colonial Assembly, meeting here in Williamsburg, was a latecomer in the field of representative government. The first was an organization known as the League of Five Nations, or the Iroquois League. It was established sometime prior to 1600 to unite five Iroquois nations in order to solve mutual problems. This Iroquois beaded belt tells the story of the member nations uniting. They adopted an oral constitution and a governing council of 50 representatives. The council dealt with items affecting the entire group but left purely tribal matters up to each individual Iroquois nation. The original five were the Onondaga, depicted in a Turtle Clan meeting here, the Seneca, Cayuga, Oneida, and Mohawk nations. 104 years after its formation, the League added a sixth nation, the Tuscarora. Women had a strong voice in the Iroquois society. The clan mother selected the chiefs and was the most powerful figure in a strong local form of government. Iroquois women owned the family crops and houses and had voting rights. Although outnumbered by rival Algonquian tribes, the Iroquois became the dominant force in the Northeast following the formation of the Iroquois League. That league continues to operate today. Artist Oren Lyons is a subchief in the Turtle Clan in the Onondaga Nation. He teaches Native American studies at Buffalo University. The Onondaga chief says the U.S. governmental ideals can be traced to the Iroquois League. Prior to drawing up his Albany Plan of Union for the colonies in 1754, Benjamin Franklin requested a meeting with the Iroquois League chiefs to learn more about the Indian Confederacy. Chief Lyons recounts the substance of the meeting between colonial leaders and the Iroquois chiefs. And it was suggested at that time by an Onondaga chief that they colonies unite uh, in a form of government that was similar to ours, that would uh, represent the people. The format is very ancient, and this is the format that was taken by the 13 colonies originally, the Articles of Confederation. There is ample evidence that Franklin was influenced by the Iroquois Confederacy when he did draw up the Albany Plan. 
Moreover, that plan was followed essentially more than 20 years later in the Articles of Confederation, the forerunner of the United States Constitution. Ben Franklin put it this way in his argument for colonial union. It would be a very strange thing if six nations of ignorant savages should be capable of forming a scheme for a union, and yet that a like union should be impracticable for ten or a dozen English colonies to whom it is more necessary. In addition to Franklin, Thomas Jefferson and George Washington were familiar with the Iroquois League. The founders of our nation were facing the problem of uniting sovereign states when they wrote the United States Constitution. And they did adopt ideas from the Iroquois League. Well, immediately, always they were warned. Ray Fadden, a Mohawk, is curator of the Six Nations Museum in Anchiota, New York. An expert on the Iroquois Confederacy, Fadden says our form of government was not born from European ideals. Over here in America, those chiefs were representatives, something like Congress, I suppose. They simply represented their clans, and since everyone belonged to a clan, in plain English, they represented their people, were put in office by their people to represent them in their government. Even today in Washington, D.C., impact is being felt from Indian governmental bodies. The Navajo Reservation headquarters at Window Rock, Arizona, is the seat of one tribal government whose actions have set off waves of reaction in the national capital. Four times a year, the Navajo Tribal Council is called into session by the council chairman. Members are the elected representatives of the largest Indian nation in the United States. On a December day in 1888, two cowboys looking for stray cattle atop a Colorado mesa became the first non-Indians to view this site. Cliff Palace, a cliff dwelling at Mesa Verde, is just one of a number of construction feats accomplished nearly a thousand years ago by some amazing Indian people. Their impact on the architecture and urban development of the Southwest is immeasurable. Anthropologists call the people who built the cliff houses members of the Anasazi culture. The culture appeared about the time of Christ. At first, the Anasazi lived in caves, giving no hint of their future architectural brilliance. Corn was their only crop. By 450 AD, the Anasazi began creating permanent housing. The pit house featured the first crude basements in the United States. Four corner posts provided support for the walls and roof, which were lacings of sticks and brush covered with thick adobe mud. In addition to developing permanent houses, the people learned to make pottery. The turkey was domesticated and beans were added to their corn crops. The Anasazi Pueblo period began developing about 750 AD. Arts and crafts flourished, trade began. Cotton was introduced, and the bow and arrow became a hunting tool and a weapon. Early in the developmental Pueblo period, the Anasazi began experimenting with stone masonry. This led to the classic Pueblo era, during which these construction geniuses built huge apartment complexes and cliff dwellings that served as early cities. The ruins of Pueblo Benito at Chaco Canyon, New Mexico, show the remains of what were truly marvelous achievements in stone masonry, engineering, architecture, and urban planning. Pueblo Benito rose to a height of five stories in some places, making the Anasazi the nation's first high-rise apartment dwellers. The complex covered three acres and contained 800 rooms in which more than 1,000 people lived. For support, the Anasazi builders made the walls thick at the base, tapering to the top. The outside veneer had the artistic touch of craftsmen. Each stone of the proper size was placed so as to be pleasing to the eye. Unlike their Anasazi brothers at Mesa Verde, the people of Chaco Canyon shunned the cliff sides and did their stone masonry on the canyon floor. The circular rooms were kivas, religious and ceremonial areas that had covered tops when the Anasazi used them. 
Today, it's difficult to comprehend the skill of those Chakawans who worked with only the most primitive tools. Sandstone was readily available, but ponderosa pine, which they chose for ceiling and floor beams, had to be carried 17 miles from the closest forest. Even more striking is the fact that Pueblo Benito was a planned community from its beginning. During the 150 years it took to complete Pueblo Benito, each succeeding generation's work fit the concept of the early designers. Of all the pioneer apartment complexes in the southwest, Pueblo Benito is the most significant. It was the nation's first real city, and it remained the biggest apartment complex in the United States until 1882, when a larger one was constructed in New York City. Those pioneer urban developers, the Anasazi, built their apartment complexes on canyon floors, on mesa tops, and in hundreds of cliffside caves. To anyone with a fear of heights, the first question is always, why would anyone live in cliff caves? They had to climb to the mesa tops to tend their crops and obtain water, so why live in the cliffs? The most logical answer appears to be for protection against marauding enemies. But why did these people abandon their great apartment cities all across the southwest shortly before the year 1300? Probably because of an extended drought that hit about that time, Perhaps another reason, no one really knows. Today we can only marvel at the contributions of the ancient Anasazi. What happened to the prehistoric Anasazi people? Their descendants are today's Pueblo Indians of New Mexico and Arizona. The Anasazi's long-standing desire for urban living is evidenced in Pueblo towns like Acoma, Sky City. Pueblo Acoma claims to be the oldest continuously occupied town in the United States, a claim that is contested only by the Hopi town of Old Oribe. Both have been inhabited for about a thousand years. The impact of the Anasazi builders is clearly evident in the classic village of Taos Pueblo in northern New Mexico. It has no running water, no electricity, no modern conveniences at all. Yet, Taos Pueblo has a beauty that reflects the Anasazi architecture of a thousand years ago. Taos dwellings are stair-stepped up to five stories high. Like their ancestors of long ago, residents of the upper floors must use ladders to come and go. Old beehive-shaped ovens are still fired up each day by Taos Pueblo women, for there is bread to be baked. This has been the daily ritual among Pueblo women for centuries, and none of today's electric or gas-heated ovens does a better job of baking bread than those old adobe kilns. With increased concern over energy shortages, modern builders are grappling with problems of heating and air conditioning. The Pueblo Indians whipped these problems long ago. Their thick adobe clay dwellings are cool in the summer and warm in the winter. Today's engineers call it utilizing mass to achieve better insulation. In case you have any doubt about the architectural contributions of the ancient Anasazi and their Pueblo descendants, just look around the Southwest. Pueblo influence is seen nearly everywhere. Even before the Anasazi began their architectural achievements in the Southwest, other Indian people were accomplishing engineering miracles. Working with only baskets to transport dirt, three separate cultures of prehistoric Indians built mounds. More than 100,000 mounds in the Midwest and Southeast. First came fairly small burial mounds from cultures called Adena and Hopewell. The mounds were just what the name implies, burial sites. Another form of early ritualistic earthwork was that of the effigy mound. The most famous is the great serpent mound in Ohio. The serpent's body is a low, rounded embankment nearly a quarter mile long. The average body width is 20 feet, and its height average is 5 feet. The builders did precision work when they made the tightly coiled tail. 
For decades, scholars have been wrestling with the true meaning of the serpent and other effigy mounds. Most likely, they were religious symbols. Huge temple mounds were the engineering wonders for an early people known as the Mississippian culture. That culture flourished for a thousand years, from about 700 AD. Those mounds were the ritual centers for natives who gave us another form of urban development. Villages were built around the temple mounds. The Oak Mulgee Mounds near Macon, Georgia, are the remains of a town site that was occupied for 200 years before being abandoned about 1100 AD. Indian mounds exist in far greater numbers than do the pyramids of Egypt, and some scholars believe they go far beyond the Egyptian achievement in their overall scope. In spite of villages like these, a false picture of Native Americans was painted by early explorers, trappers, and settlers. Those early observers did not understand Indian culture and deduced that all Indians were hunters, nomads whose home was wherever the big game took them. In truth, there were more village-dwelling Indians than nomadic hunters. The recreated Cherokee village of Jalagi at Tahlequah, Oklahoma, represents a typical southeastern Indian city of the 1600s. These modern Cherokees are preserving the centuries-old culture and customs of an advanced people who were native to the southeast, but who were relocated in Oklahoma by the government during the 1830s. The Cherokee village is yet another form of urban development in which Indians used materials available to them, mud, cane, and timbers to build their town. Villages like these were early civic center approaches to urban living. Indians everywhere displayed an ability to adapt to their environment, and that adaptability is best illustrated by their housing. Plains Indians who followed the buffalo needed portability, and so they lived in the teepee. Trees were scarce in the homeland of the Pawnees, Mandans, and Arikaras, so they designed earth lodges. Caddo farmers chose thatched grass houses. Navajos came up with the eight-sided hogan. A southwest group, the Apaches, preferred a temporary house called the Wikiup. Wichita tribesmen built spectacular grass houses. Northwest fishermen constructed wood homes. This is an ornate Haida house. Northeast Indian families lived in longhouses. The design was copied in World War II Quonset huts. The Seminoles of Florida needed only a breezy chicky for protection, while the Eskimo of the frozen north used the insulation properties of snow for his winter house in the Yukon. Even today, Native American impact is being felt in contemporary architecture. The symbolism revered by Indians is being used in design work by architect Dennis Sun Rhodes, a northern Arapaho. He used the symbol of the Turtle Clan in the design of the Native American Center for the Living Arts at Niagara Falls, New York. We've seen those first huge apartment cities of the Pueblo Indians. To sustain people in these first urban complexes, community farms were needed, and farm crops needed water. This is the legacy of a group of native people called the Hohokam culture, our first land reclamationists. I'm descending into an irrigation canal that represents the Hohokam culture at a late stage of development. Some of these canals were as wide as 25 feet, as deep as 15 feet. Some were lined with clay. One network of canals along the Salt River totaled 150 miles. At one time, these canals carried water to many thousands of acres of farmland, and that was more than a thousand years ago. The Hohokams proved that man could farm the desert land of Arizona by building irrigation canals. 
They began their experiments as early as the year 300 B.C. Using stone axes and hoes, the Hohokams developed serviceable canal systems during a 400-year time span. Their skill resulted in extraordinary water engineering projects that were the greatest irrigation achievements by ancient man on this continent. This irrigation canal is part of the first modern reclamation project in the United States. And that project, in turn, is based upon ancient Native American models. Many of the Salt River Project canals in and around Phoenix, Arizona, follow exactly the routes engineered by the ancient Hohokam. The impact of the Hohokam water projects can be seen today in lush farm crops growing on former desert land. Today's Pima and Papago Indians of Arizona are descendants of those incredible canal builders of more than 10 centuries ago. But today, the Pima farmers have replaced Hohokam digging sticks with modern farm implements. Native American contributions in the field of agriculture are many and varied. Corn, or maize, first domesticated in Mexico, is the best known crop of Indians of the Americas. Among the leading native agronomists were the Aricaras, a northern farming tribe who developed seven different varieties of maize, including one strain that would mature quickly in a short growing season. As horticulturalists, Native Americans have a record that few races can match, domesticating more than 40 plants. None of the foods cultivated by natives was known to the old world, including the white potato, which somehow became labeled the Irish potato. All the food on this 